Well, in case you didn't hear, our recording is in progress. We're, um, you know, it just kind of serendipitously happened this way that uh, we are studying the chapter on the crucifixion just two days before we observe uh, the crucifixion. So uh, hopefully you like that little alignment. Uh, I was working on trying to make that work out just for so long, you know, I had to just no, it's completely, it's completely arbitrary that that happened. But, uh, you know, was it arbitrary? That's the other question. Um, yep. we, we, we have been looking at, um, we have been looking at uh, the passion narrative. And this, of course, is the narrative that begins with Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, which tomorrow evening at the church, uh, uh, we observe in the Monday Thursday service. Um and then Jesus explaining himself uh, uh, and his mission that the signs that we've been looking at and reading about have all been pointing to, and that is the glorification uh, of Jesus uh, on the cross that brings about this new consciousness of what it means to be human and a new kind of universalism uh, that we're going to explore today. And then you know how the narrative proceeds after that. Uh, you have Judas who be betrays Jesus. You have the arrest and you have Peter's denial. Uh, and then you have Jesus appearing before Pilate. Jesus also being sent off to Herod, a, a classic example of bureaucratic um, uh, of strategy there. And Pilate says, well, this guy's a Galilean. He, he needs to go to Herod. And Herod sends, sends him back to Pilate, and you can just see Pilate rolling his eyes saying, oh my gosh, I thought I was through with this guy. But we concluded last time with, you know, looking at the symbolism of, of some of these characters, and in good Spong fashion, as you know, he is saying, he's pretty bold in saying, <clears throat> it's pretty unlikely that these things ever historically happened, you know, especially the way that we're we're told about uh, now, in the synoptics, <clears throat> you know, there is this passion narrative that's followed fairly closely, but Spong is convinced that for the writing purposes of, of the author of the Gospel of John, writing to this Johannine community, roughly between 90 and 100 of the Common Era, and to that community in their contextual experience, they have just been kicked out of the synagogue for for many years, even prior to the, the worshiping, or the, even prior to the destruction of the temple, uh, they were worshiping in synagogues with the Jews. But because of their persistence, I guess, in uh, claiming Jesus to be the Messiah uh, and, and claiming so many aspects of, of Jesus' life to be, you know, or told in the scriptures, and, and perhaps most uh, egregious to the Jews as claiming Jesus to be God, they were eventually kicked out uh, of the synagogue. And now they are a, a rather precarious community off on their own, no longer under the protection of the Jewish synagogue. When the Jewish synagogue had certain protections against the Romans and the Roman persecution, and it's a very difficult time for, for them. And so the writing of the Gospel of John, at least the final writing of the Gospel of John, because we know that it is probably written in sections beginning maybe around 80 of the Common Era, according to Spong. The writing of the Gospel of John is trying to address this situation, this precarious existence, uh, most likely in the city of, of Ephesus, where the Johannine community fled to after the, the destruction of the temple. Um, Spong says all of these characters that we meet in the Passion narrative have a symbolic significance. Uh, first, you have Judas that we saw. Judas who walks in the darkness and, you know, has, has no interest in pursuing the light, is completely blind to the light of Jesus. And then we see Peter, uh, who is is a, a faithful follower of Jesus, but, you know, has anxiety about letting go of, you know, the things that, that hold him so fast to this, to his old tradition. He doesn't want to break loose from the, 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 the secure walls around uh, that he has built 
around himself through his Jewish faith and also, you know, his own psychological walls that he builds around himself. Then, of course, Pilate, this, this representative of state authority who sees in Jesus uh, something, uh, something to be admired, but not necessarily to follow. And there, there's a lot of reflection we can do with Pilate, because I think a lot of people in, in this in secular authority, uh, and this is certainly the, the position of the Enlightenment uh, philosophers, see in Jesus someone to admire, but not someone to follow into the light, you know, their, their path is taking them elsewhere. You know, I think of, you know, some of the Enlightenment um, founders of this, this nation who were willing to listen to the words of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus up to a certain extent, but they weren't willing to go the full distance. Think of Thomas Jefferson, for example, of claiming that Jesus was God, of claiming that Jesus provides um, access to uh, this, this new life and this new consciousness of, of what it means truly to be human. And so th these three people um, represent aspects of the experience that the Johannine community is having. And we haven't seen yet the model that they are supposed to follow. And this, this is such a beautiful chapter to be reading at um uh, at this time of the year right before the um you know right before right before easter but what i'd like to do before we talk about chapter 25 is just remind you of something that we have because it matches up very beautifully with what we're going to be talking about uh something that i've taught about before uh i think i did a sunday school class several years ago doesn't seem like that long ago on the eisenheim altar piece uh, this was an altar piece painted by Matthias Grunewald uh, in Eisenheim uh, in Germany uh, in the middle of or the early part of the 16th century. And if you know a little bit about what altar pieces are like, these panels over on, if you can see my cursor, these panels shut and and they can be replaced with with other panels that open and close and they can be used at different times during the liturgical year uh this is what the eisenheim altarpiece would have looked like 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 at uh holy week at the time of holy week now the the monastery at eisenheim was known for its treatment of uh victims of the plague and so uh, this is why we have St. Anthony on the, uh, the right-hand panel over here. Uh, the people who were uh, suffering from the plague were also, they were referred to as those suffering from St. Anthony's fire, these boils, these pustules that arise on their skin. And so St. Anthony is one who in the midst of, uh, you know, great tribulation is able to maintain this sense of calm then St. Sebastian here, who is uh, often appealed to uh, during the plague as uh, a, a saint for healing. Uh, but in the middle of uh, the scene from the Gospel of John, which I think fully encap encapsulates the Gospel of John itself. And, and hopefully, as you look at this, you will have, a, have better insight into the you know the center panel than you would have maybe a year ago you know before we read this book but of course you have you know the crucifixion of christ and the place where we're going to start today is this sign up the top called the titulus and you have over here on the right holding the gospel or excuse me i shouldn't say the uh, holding the gospel, I should say, holding the Torah or the holding the the law and the prophets, and and this is what Swang is talking about. This is John pointing to Jesus. Remember, John said, "I'm I'm not the one uh, that that you're looking for, but I am the the precursor, the one who is announcing him." And J John, the author, is going to talk about how Jesus fulfills the scriptures 
Uh, and so this, this image of John the Baptist here pointing, or excuse me, John the evangelist here pointing to Christ uh, is important. Now, and now I'm finding myself confused because I've always thought this was John the Baptist, but it most likely is John the evangelist. Sorry, I did, I, I'm starting to question myself here. But either one, uh, the holy saints John, let's call them, are uh, you know are certainly relevant here. Um, down here you have the Paschal Lamb, which is certainly what the the evangelist is wanting to um, uh, portray Jesus as, as we will see today. The Paschal Lamb, that that sacrifice that is offered up at at Yom Kippur uh, to banish death. Um, over on, on the left, down at the bottom here, you have the misrepresentation of Mary Magdalene. Um, th this is Mary Magdalene, who is, who is believed to be, in this case, the woman with the, the, the alabaster jar. Um, and, of course, we know that, that those two were not uh, the same. But that's okay. <laughs> you know, a lot of Marys in the gospel that we can get confused about. And then the focus of our attention today is going to be on this group, this small uh, group here. Uh, notice that, you know, in Renaissance paintings, Mary is usually uh, portrayed in blue, uh, the symbol of purity. Uh, and here she is portrayed in white, you know, this really you know uh this this symbol of of the nurse right the the healer and this would have been of, of great um solace to those who were in the monastery uh and and praying of course through saint anthony and or saint sebastian for for healing uh, but holding mary here and 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 what i want to focus on today is is this close relationship here uh this bonding you might say, and this is what Spong focuses on in our chapter, between Mary looking to her son, and then this person that John the Evangelist refers to as the beloved disciple. And both of these people, as Spong has already you know, indicated, are not going to be historical figures. They are going to be um, they're going to be symbolic figures that are going to give, much like the Eisenheim altar, altarpiece did, uh, they are going to give solace to the Johannine community who's hearing the story of the passion itself. Then finally, uh, the, the bottom panel uh, is, of course, what happens after the death of Jesus. You have Mary and what looks like, again, the beloved disciple removing Christ from the cross. And if you look closely at some of the imagery, let me see if I can, this, by the way, this gives you a sense of the size of that. Here are the people around here. So that's about 14 or 15 feet across, about eight, eight feet high, maybe something like that. Um, so, so really takes up a lot of, of room in uh, the cathedral itself. Uh, and would be hard to miss. It would be the center of, of, of worship. Um, here's the image of Christ being taken down from the cross. And if you look at his body and you know the story of the passion and, and the scourging and everything, you will see that the cuts and the, the bruises on his body, here's, here's the place we'll focus on today, you know, the place where the sword pierces his side. But these don't look indicative of someone who's who's been whipped. You don't see these lashes or things like that. He's certainly a, a person who's gone through great tribulation. But this would have been what the body of the plague, uh, those those suffering through the plague, uh, would have looked like. This would have been, you know, uh, an image that they understood. You know the same with Christ on on the cross as we will as we will see as well. Um, so today, I mean, and perhaps even throughout Holy Week, I mean, you can find this image on uh, on the internet. But uh, you know, just reflecting on 
uh, this imagery in the context of reading Spong. It's, a, it's such a beautiful, um, this by the way, was Carl Barth's favorite, uh, favorite painting. Uh, this is in visual form, all of the chapters of John compiled into one. Um, any comments or, or questions about that, about this? Please. As you know, you know, as as the liturgical year progresses, these these images would be replaced. These panels would be opened up in new ways and you would see different images and you can find those uh, if you search for them on the Internet as well. Well, let's. Um, go back to the story where we left off last week. And this is where uh, Pilate, try as he might, cannot you know, convince the Jews that they are perhaps, and the Jews being the authorities who want to see Jesus dead because they perceive him as a threat. Pilate cannot convince them that perhaps maybe they're a little bit, bit misguided, you know, until finally we hear from Caiaphas, the high priest uh, saying to Caesar, "We have no God. We have no king but Caesar, right?" Which is the worst thing that a, a Jew can possibly say. That's tantamount to idolatry, and tantamount, ironically, you know, that this kind of idolatry and blasphemy is tantamount to to death. <laughs> and so the irony here, especially for for a, a Jew reading this in the first century would have been really, really thick, you know? Here are these people calling for the death of an innocent man who are in fact themselves creating, uh, you know, indulging in the most idolatrous of all sins during the first century of the Roman Empire to claim they have no king but Caesar. And what they finally are able to do is to convince Caesar, look, this isn't simply a religious issue. This guy is also uh, guilty of sedition. He is trying to take kingship away from not just, you know, the Jews. He's trying to, to take power over Rome as well. And then this is something that 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 Pilate cannot, you know, ignore. Uh, Pilate, who historically was was kind of in hot water with the Romans, with with Caesar anyway, because he. Uh, well, first of all, he was given you know how our diplomatic corps is the the nice people the, the 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 people who give a lot of money will usually go to places like london and uh and uh places like paris i'm talking about in the 21st century right uh but those who are are our are, are career diplomats will will be sent to places like <laughs> i don't know name one uh uh moscow or or uh uh, a place where there's a lot of conflict and a lot of a lot of turmoil. Uh, <clears throat> Nigeria, where, for example, or, or, or a place. That's, what's that? Upper Volta. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, not not exactly the place you you go and bring your suntan lotion. Uh, it's a place you go and you bring your your bulletproof vest. Well, that's who that's yep. who the pilot was. Yep. I, go ahead, Denny. I didn't hear you. Timbuktu. <laughs> yeah, Timbuktu, which is literally a place. I mean, yeah, right, exactly. Um, uh, so that's who Pilate was, you know, and he had the hardest time in the 10 years he was there keeping the Jews under, you know, under control. Uh, and he was finally recalled in 36 of the Common Era. So Pilate responds to this, um, you know, this veiled threat, really, from the religious authorities by saying, well, I guess uh, you, you've got you've got me in the corner. Checkmate. Uh, this man needs to be crucified, and Jesus does uh, take on you know take on the cross and is uh, um, is crucified. But before doing so, uh, Pilate has erected or has uh, nailed to the top of the cross in three different languages what is referred to as the titulus or the title uh, that we often see it. Let me see if I can find it. We often see it in our, sometimes we'll see it on the cross or sometimes we'll see it uh, 
uh, listed symbolic, but it looks like INRI, right? I-N-R-I. Uh, in Latin, Jesu uh, Eudioi, Rene, I think Rene, uh, King of King of the Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. I can't remember the Latin, but that's the you know that's the acronym up above. But when we see it as you know as stated like this, INRI or I N R I, we don't often realize first of all, a what it means or B, that it was actually written in three different languages. It was written in Aramaic, it was written in Greek, and it was written in Latin. Aramaic was the language of the Jews at the time. Greek was the lingua franca that everybody spoke, a holdover from 300 years and, you know, Alexander the Great, Hellenization, and of course, Latin being the bureaucratic uh, language of, of the Romans. And so, this symbolizes, according to Spong, this universal character of who Jesus is, bringing all three of these groups together, the insular group of the Jews, uh, the cultural group of, of, the, of the Greeks, you know, the, the Hellenized uh, world, as well as the, the world of power uh, that we see in the Romans uh, as well. And then the Jews get really upset with him, right? you should say this man believes himself to be king of the Jews. And, and then, of course, Pilate says, I've written uh, what I've written. I've written what I've written. Um, Jesus is taken to the cross, is crucified, and there this whole drama unfolds. Um, and I'd and, and like to talk a little bit about that today, but but the one thing that John wants to emphasize is that how much of this drama at the cross fulfills the scriptures. Now, when we say this, we don't mean that the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures were predicting that these things were going to happen, but that Jesus fits a type that is seen throughout the Hebrew scriptures. The, of David who suffers, for example, of, of the Messiah who suffers, or the Messiah who is chosen of God. Um, John has been making these little pointers throughout his gospel of how Jesus is um, uh, very much like the new Moses, right? His body is the new manna from heaven. We've seen a lot of this. Now at the cross, we're going to see how how many of these scriptures are going to be fulfilled, if I can use that term, or if they, or they're going to be seen, the, the events of the crucifixion are going to be lenses through which we are going to be asked to remember, especially if we're Jews, scripture that we would know quite well, whether it's from Zechariah or from the Psalms or from Exodus or, or wherever. So this is still very, very Jewish in its orientation, and John doesn't want to shirk, uh, you know, away from that. Um, any comments about that or questions so far? Well, two symbolic figures at, at the cross, one of those being Mary, and then the Eisenheim altarpiece uh, here, you know, seen as the faithful Mary of, you know, in grief, yet still raising, clasping her hands in worship of, of her son. And the other is going to be this character that, who's not named, but is simply named, is simply called the beloved disciple. Uh, Spong makes the point that in the Gospel of John is the only place where Mary, the mother of Jesus, appears at the foot of the cross. Each of the synoptic Gospels, um, it's interesting that, you know, as the Gospels get further, further away from the actual events, you know, so you have Mark, they have Matthew and Luke, and then you have John, Mark and 70, and John being written 20 years later. As they get further and further away from the events of the cross, it's interesting that more and more people get closer and closer and closer to the cross, 
uh, you know, in the telling of the passion narrative. And in this case, the two people uh, who are at the, the foot of the cross are Mary and uh, the beloved disciple. Um, and Spong kind of goes off on a little tangent that I think it, it would be really interesting for us sometime to look at. And that is just the way that uh, the Mariology, as it's called, or the worship of Mary or the reverence of Mary uh, developed in the early uh, in the early decades of the church and also in the, in the first 1,000 years of the church. Uh, if you read with a discerning eye, the synoptics, Mary doesn't Mary the mother of Jesus does not really play a significant role in the life of Jesus. But by the time you get to the high Middle Ages, and for reasons that I'd love to go into, but I can't because we'll be on it all day. But by the time we get to the high Middle Ages, Mary is just a, a notch below the Trinity in terms of the reverence. And, and still today in the Catholic Church is still revered in, in this way as, uh, you know, you pray through Mary and you're, you're you know, the kind of control, not, not control, the kind of influence a mother has over her son, right? Well, pray to Mary and, and she'll get things done. Mary is not seen as a significant figure in the synoptics. However, at the foot of the cross, she has a symbolic role. And, and actually, we'll get to that because Spong later develops it. Uh, but the other person, and this is the one who is really kind of the mystery figure of the Gospel of John. He's simply referred to as the beloved disciple. And there have been all kinds of, there's been all kinds of conjecture throughout history as who this beloved disciple actually was. Uh, we, obviously, he was one of the disciples, right? So was he John, who we presume is writing the Gospel of John? Or was he Thomas or James? Presumed Thomas is the twin of Jesus and James is the brother of Jesus. Or is he uh, even Mary Magdalene in a kind of a, a veiled way? Uh, Spong says all of these, all of these uh, suggestions have been proposed by, by scholars, but there's one, and this is a minority, suggestion, but Spong makes a really good point. He says, let's look at the language that's used around this beloved disciple. Where else in the gospel do we see a, an associate of Jesus, one who, a disciple is one who has been taught by Jesus, uh, where the language of love is directed specifically towards that person? Uh, the disciple that Jesus loves best. And Spong makes the point that we're talking about Lazarus here. Uh, throughout John chapter 11, uh, the emphasis on Jesus loving Lazarus is, is very, very clear. When Mary sends word to Jesus, she says, uh, my brother Lazarus, whom you love, uh, has has died, or I can't remember, he's already died, or he's he's sick, and you need to come and heal him, um, and Jesus waits for three days, right, and then when he comes to the tomb where Lazarus is, Jesus weeps, and then, and the, and the people say, well, look, look how he loved Lazarus, he loved him, so this language of love is directed nowhere else at a disciple other than Lazarus in the Gospel of John, now, Lazarus has a lot of symbolic baggage, or a lot of sim symbolic, I should call it baggage, uh, a lot of symbolic power. Because remember who he is. He is the one who passed from death into life, as Jesus is going eventually to do on the cross. Lazarus passed from death into life. He was in the tomb for quite some time, for three days. He comes out. Uh, Jesus, Jesus calls him out, and and Lazarus is comes back into life. Well, what a wonderful symbolism to represent 
the Johannine community who's hearing this story, right? The Johannine community who, for all in, for for all experience, you know, at this time in ninety of the Common Era era, perhaps perceived themselves in the midst of the darkness of the tomb of death. They'd been ex, you know, completely excommunicated from uh, from the synagogue for their faith for their, you know, their loyalty to their understanding of Jesus as the word of God, and for their understanding and their uh, their loyalty to this idea that Jesus brings a new teaching and a new way of being into the world. So who better to portray <clears throat> the experience of the Johannine community than the one who dies, but through the call of Christ is brought into a new life. And I think that's a great argument. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know Spong is seen by so many to be a heretic, but I have found very little in this book that that repels me, you know, um, you know, which I probably wouldn't say in very many evangelical circles. But but here we are two days before Good Friday. Let me ask your opinions and comments what uh do you have any reaction to this thoughts down the line dan yes my thought is i have a question in my mind about if jesus is showing us or john intends jesus to be showing us how to act or behave yeah. um this idea that we can be that close to someone who is moving from lack of understanding to understanding is is that something that would be symbolically possible in in jesus relationship to lazarus um so not so much i, I guess i can you can you say your question in a different way because well, i don't know he, I'm not sure I know what you mean. In, in terms of thinking of his behavior, that is Jesus' behavior as an example for us that John wants us to understand, we see the relationship we would have with someone in our oh. lives, perhaps, who is coming from a lack of understanding to understanding. Yeah, yeah. If, yeah. if understanding is part of that love context that we're talking about, just, yeah. just wondering. No, no, I think that's uh, that's a really great insight. Um, and and how does that that understanding? How does how does death get overcome by life? But from the call of Jesus, and of course, and because we're talking now about a, a kind of a proclamation aspect of what we are called as a church to do, right? Uh, we are called now to be the body of Christ. We are called now to be the Word of God that's calling forth those who have have died but have not completely like Judas gone into the darkness you know those who um for whom there is still hope to bring back into life I, I really I really like that that imagery is that how you were suggesting it well that's kind of what I was seeing in, yeah. in maybe John's purpose for telling the story the way he does and using the figures that he has included. So um, do you do you have an example, for example, uh, you know, from your own, you don't have to get too personal, but uh, I'm just wondering if you have a recent experience that, that made you think about that. Oh, not, necess thought. not necessarily, but this this idea that we're exploring with the power of love and yeah. the spirit being loved. And and the gospel being about love, um, Jesus embodying love, the mm -hmm. church passing along what we can from the symbol that we see and the actions that we see. It right. just seemed to be um, something that anybody reading it or listening to it would say, I think I understand now because the relationship with their Jewish brothers and sisters was going to have to include a lot of this. Kind of well, exactly. Community. And that brings us precisely <laughs> to this is why Spong did not immediately uh, uh, elaborate on the symbolic image of Mary in the at the foot of the cross. Uh, so here's the beloved disciple. 
who is representative of the Johannine community. What does Mary represent? Well, um, you can, let me just read this quote from, from Spong before we move on to this. Um, regarding Lazarus, I, I jumped to Mary too quickly, I'm sorry. Lazarus is a mythological character. A mythological character, as Carl Jung would say, would be an archetype. This is like the paragon. This is the 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 example that with which our experience and our life is intimately and profoundly connected. He is a mythological character, a symbol of those who see, of those who respond, and those who are transformed. He is the archetype of the Jesus movement. He represents the ones who are born of the spirit, the ones who are able to taste and experience, to share in the new life that Jesus came to bring. He is the Lazarus who passed from death to life. The one who knows that to be in Christ is to have the life of God flow through him as the life of the vine flows through the branches. There's that beautiful image that, that Spong has made so much of. Jesus is the vine and, and we are the branches. Lazarus is the, the, the prime example of it, this. The life flowing so much through him that, you know, that 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 this dead branch, is, as you might suspect a branch to be in the winter, is brought back to life in the spring. The life flows back through it. He is a symbol of, an, of the new creation, a reference here to Paul, the first citizen of the new Israel the ultimate representative of the Johannine community of believers. So remember the new Israel, this new creation is going to be one that is not exclusive. It's one that is inclusive. This was the messianic call of the Jews right from the very beginning. Remember when they, they lost their, I guess their imperial ambitions for you know to put somebody like david on the throne once again you know after the babylonian captivity they had to understand themselves in a new way and that new way was they were going to be a community that would represent that they would be a messianic community that would represent the love of god for the world and all nations would flock to jerusalem would come to jerusalem and there behold the glory of god well that didn't quite work out the way they had hoped. And so the Messianic community of the Jews becomes the individual person, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And it is through this Messiah that all of the world will be gathered unto Jerusalem, so to speak. The church is this new Jerusalem, this new Israel, this new creation. And this is an image that we see at the end of the book of Revelation that we, we also just, we well, a couple of years ago, just finished reading. So who's Mary? Mary is the symbol of the Judaism that through which the Messiah has, has passed. It's not as if the church needs to reject those from whom they came. They are still part of a co covenant community, even though that covenant community, like you're saying, Sharon, may be mired in, in death, may be mired in darkness. They are nevertheless to be cradled in the arms of the church. Look at the image here of the beloved disciple and this almost preternaturally long extension of an arm holding the image of Mary, tight, you know, very firmly, hand clasped around her, her left arm, you know, his, his arm around her waist. This is the new church. This is the Johannine community. These this is the image of the people who have rejected them. But that rejection must not turn into hate. If it does, it must not 
turn into divisiveness, you know, descent, uh, any kind of divisiveness. If it does, then the image of Jesus, the image of the church as the word of God, you know, the new incarnation of Christ has, has completely turned us back on its mission. And so uh, Jesus from the cross, his last words, well, close to his last words are, woman, behold your son. Israel, the Jews, behold your offspring, the church the Johannine community in this case. And beloved, and he says to the beloved disciple, uh, well, he basically says, behold your mother, or beloved disciple, behold your mother. Uh, tensions between you must be overcome. You are on the same mission path. Um, yes, there, there is understanding that needs to be you know, nurtured understanding that needs to be grown between you, but this is not a situation, lest the image of Christ be lost in you, this is not a situation where you turn your back on your mother, the church, or excuse me, your mother, the, the Jewish you know, community. They believe that the Torah is the word of God. You, Johannine community, you know that the word of God is Christ. But there's so much connection between these two. This is why it's so important for John to place Jesus and his crucifixion in the context of uh, the imagery that comes from the Hebrew Bible. And we'll talk about that in, in, in our next slide here. But the crucifixion of Christ, the glorification of Christ, Christ being held up like the serpent in, in the desert, you know, this, this, this overcoming of death is also an overcoming of barriers. And this is Spong's quote, the work of Christ is almost over. Speaking from the cross to the beloved disciple, the Johannine community and Israel, Mary. Work of Christ is almost over. Reconciliation of the deepest divisions in human life is being accomplished. In the narrative in which the mother is commended to care for the beloved disciple, the barriers separating the human family are portrayed as falling away. That doesn't, did I, did I write that correctly? Because all of a sudden I'm not, uh, all of a sudden I'm not understanding that. Is commended, oh, commended, okay. Commended to the care of the beloved disciple. I'm sorry. When the beloved disciple is told to care for the mother in the narrative, uh, I'm sorry, in the narrative in which the mother is commended to the care of the beloved disciple, the barriers separating the human family are portrayed as falling away. Beautiful symbol of, of what the cross is supposed to represent, and that is reconciliation between God and the world, but also reconciliation among the divisions in the world as well. Uh, comments or questions that I can entertain. Uh, Dan? Yeah, Danny. Uh, lest, lest we forget at this very time, uh, it seems to me the synagogue must have been at a point of great peril itself in terms of where, where are we going? Yeah. What will become of us? Yes. And thus brooking no deviation right right and naturally your your natural tendency is going to be to to do the very thing that jesus is trying to overcome the teaching and that is to build the barriers around you to build the walls around you um and and this is a place where even though you know the the, the worship in the temple is gone the synagogue worship starts to take on some of the same trappings of conservatism that we saw in the temple worship. Up until the destruction of the temple, the synagogue was a place where there was a lot of, you know, kind of reform 
uh, reformed understanding of, of the law was taking place. But in this context, with the temple gone and the Romans breathing down your neck, the natural tendency is to become conservative, you know, to, to, to batten down the hatch and, and fall back on what you know well and, and don't take any new chances. And what is, what is Jesus doing here but calling forth people from the synagogue, you know, to open the hatches, tear down the barriers, and take chances and to truly understand what it means to be human, which means to allow the universal, universalizing life and love of God to flow through you as energy from a vine, you know, to the branches, to become one with the body of Christ, the suffering body of Christ. So as the disciples say throughout the Gospel of John, this is a hard, this is a hard teaching. <laughs> you better believe it is. You know? And it's one the world still doesn't quite understand. Other comments? Thank Dan? you. Yeah. Hey, we keep coming back to our favorite metaphor, which is the vine and its branches. Right. What would we do without metaphors? <laughs> Well, yeah, and understanding Spong. Yeah, yeah, um, and and this is this is what he is trying to say. I mean, this whole book is is filled with his symbols are are metaphors, right? You know, um, uh, <clears throat> this this book is filled with symbolism. But you know, ironically, in our very scientifically oriented age, we insist on reading this as history, and in so doing, you know, it's like. It's like reading the Bible like you'd read a refrigerator manual, kind of a how-to uh, document, right? This is how to get to heaven. And, you know, I follow point A, point B, and you know, all this kind of stuff. I put slot A into, <laughs> into this this little place. And reading this text as symbolism appeals to everything that makes us truly human, right? This kind of mystical understanding of the world where we see truth out of the corner of our eye you know dwight marsh at this point would pop in and say emily dickinson tell the truth but tell it slant right well that's what's happening here right uh john is telling the truth but telling it slant the beloved disciple you know mary all of these symbolic figures it's just you know it's just rife with symbolism well, moving on to the, um, unless there are other questions, please just pop in because it's great stuff. Uh, chapter 26 talks about the last words of Christ. And of course, this image from the Eisenheim altarpiece, once again, you can see the, the scars on the body of Christ, reminiscent of what many people during the plague uh, suffered through, something called St. Anthony's fire. Uh, but here on the right side, you have the the spear wound, or the you know you know that in the Johannine story, because the Sabbath was approaching, they the Roman soldiers. I don't know if they're Roman soldiers went out to the uh, to the the crucifixion scene and broke the legs of uh, those who were hung on the cross. But by this time, Jesus was already dead. And so they did not break his his legs. Um, but upon leaving, a soldier pierced his side, and from his side comes blood and water. That just seems like a kind of a gory detail, doesn't it? Um, but all of this is is symbolic, as as Spong wants us to, you know, really tie into. Um, We've just been talking about Jewish survival and erecting the barriers, uh, but this and their, you know, their reluctance, hesitancy to understand Jesus as the new word of God, to which scripture points, and this is jo John's intent here, if you were going to be that beloved disciple holding Mary, holding the, the, the Jewish people in your arms and calling them forth, you have to give them a sense of how Jesus fulfills or how Jesus' life can be read through the lens of the Hebrew Bible. That this glorification of, of Christ on the cross, this ironic crucifixion is Jesus' glorification, 
also opens the door to inclusivity, which breaks down the barriers and, and, and ushers us into a new age of, of universalism. But for Jews to understand that, they must be able to see Jesus through the lens of their scriptures. And that's why so many of the images that we've been looking at throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus, you know, uh, appear to, to uh, be um, reminiscent of or appear to point us in the direction of images that we know from the Bible. The feeding of the 5,000, the man of, from, coming from heaven, for example, uh, is, is reminiscent of, of Moses in the desert. Jesus is, is seen as firmly established in the Jewish tradition, and it's no different with his crucifixion. Um, the breaking of the legs, so I'm remembering my, my scriptures here, when the soldiers go out to the cross and break the legs of the, uh, the other two people who are being crucified, but they do not break the legs of, of Jesus. That is, you know, uh, seen as a symbol of, you know, the perfect Paschal lamb who, who has no blemish, right? Uh, the Paschal lamb, in order for it to be an honorable sacrifice to God, must be without uh, blemish of any kind. Um, in Psalm 22, 18, it also talks about uh, they divide my clothes amongst themselves. For my clothing, they cast lots. We know about, you know, uh, the, the soldiers at the foot of the cross casting lots for, for Jesus' uh, garment. In Zechariah uh, 12, 10, um, and I will pour out my spirit. Now, Zechariah was a, a, a prophet speaking after the fall of the, uh, excuse me, after the, the Babylonian captivity during the time of renewal of the, um, the land of, of Israel and talking about the day of the Lord that's coming. And I will pour out my spirit of compassion and supplication on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem that, so that when they look on the one whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. This, this notion of the soldier piercing the side of Jesus, as Spong would say, probably did not historically happen. But symbolically, when we hear that as people grounded in the Jewish faith, who know their Torah and who know their scriptures well, they would have been placed in that Jewish context. It would have been like a, uh, you know, a very clear signal. You know, not Zechariah was, you know, foretelling that this would happen, but this happens in the. I can't think of a good way of saying it. Um, this, this happens in the sim symbolic context of what Zechariah is is trying to. Uh, to portray here. Uh, Jesus from the cross says, I thirst. And this is a reference in John, he says this. And this is a reference to Psalm 69, uh, verse 21. Um, they gave me poison for food. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. You know, um, this is, you know, David uh, thinking about his enemies and his treatment and, you know, offering up on a hyssop uh, stick, a sponge full of vinegar would have placed people in the mind of six, uh, uh, Psalm 69. But the place where we really want to focus, or at least according to Spong, is what the symbolism of what comes from the side of Jesus. Now think of the body of Christ. Think of the body of Jesus but also, also think of the body of Christ as the church. And what does the church provide to the world? What does the church provide, let's say, to, to Mary, the, you know, the Jewish nation? What does the church in its universalizing uh, mission uh, provide to the world? But baptism and 
the blood of Christ in the Eucharist, the, sacra the sacraments of the church, signs of the new kingdom. Uh, and this, of course, is what um, the, the gospel writer, the Johannine community wants to uh, portray. You know, a, a new day has dawned. Entrance into this community is open to all, but it requires dying. And remember, at this time, baptism was probably done by complete immersion. It's one of the reasons I, I regret never having uh, experienced adult baptism, you know, the way they do it in the South. You know, you go under a river and you get dunked under and they keep you under for quite some time. I've, I've seen it happen, you know into the murky green waters of some Appalachian, you know, swimming hole. And then out of that water, you come and into this new life, you know, uh, this, this is what the church provides. This was the experience of Lazarus, right? <laughs> this is the experience that's open to all. And being nurtured by the spirit by the blood of christ is experienced in that as well of uh, being grafted to the vine becoming part of this new consciousness this universalizing consciousness that breaks down barriers uh, this is what is accomplished in the so-called glorification this ironic paradoxical reference to the death of christ on the cross so with that, um, I will bid you farewell for the week, and hopefully this will offer some food for thought, no pun intended, uh, as you go into, you know, the triduum, as they call it, the, the Good Friday and, and Saturday, and then, the, and then Easter Sunday, and this notion that is, you know, this the central, the central theme and the central uh, celebration of the Christian year. It's ironic that most people think of it, think of Christmas as the center of, of <laughs> but, but this is, this is a completely different observance, isn't it? Easter, Good Friday and Easter, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter. It's the center of the season. This is the center of our liturgical year. Um, any last words, uh, in the last comments, Dan, I just think yeah. it's interesting. I think it's interesting to note how he Spong links back to the, his earlier writing, like the water and the blood. You know, that's yeah. the feast of the Cana of turning right. the water into wine. Uh, Lazarus, you know, again a, a link back to uh, the earlier stories. Right, right, and and those earlier stories are seen as in themselves signs of what is yet to come, right? And, then, and so it's, it perfectly connects with each other. Lest you forget, you might remember Mary and the turning of the water into wine. Well, guess what? Yeah, thanks for pointing that out because that's a that's a that's something I wanted to say. I mean, here we have the water and the, the blood and the, the water and the blood at the foot of the cross, right? All of these things have been what what is the right word the, the right literary word there uh, prefigured i think is what they say have been prefigured in some of the events of of the gospel of john any other comments well i wish you all a happy easter whether you're here in hastings or in arizona or Col colorado or did i miss anybody <laughs> And wish your Jewish friends happy Passover. Yes, yes, which begins next Thursday on April 13. So, okay, everybody, I will uh, stop the share here and we will be on our way. It's good seeing you. Have Thank a wonderful you. week.